While working on sizing a motor for your system, you may run across the question, what is the load to motor inertia ratio? The follow-up question to that is then, what is an acceptable value? Let's talk about it and see what we can learn. I'm Corey Foster of Valen Corporation. If you have any questions, need any help, reach out to us at this email address and website here. We're always happy to help. The first question is, what is inertia? Inertia is that property of matter which causes a resistance to any change in the motion of a body. Change is a very important word here. Let's pay attention to that. So let's ask ourselves this question. It's a favorite question of mine during interviews. Which wheel has the higher inertia if they have the same mass and the same diameter, but one is hollow? Okay, so maybe one is longer or they have a different density. Which wheel has that higher inertia? The answer is the hollow one. So let's ask this follow-up question. Is if they both start down the incline at the same time, which one is going to reach the bottom first? If you have two of them, you let them go at the same time, which one is going to hit the bottom first? Well, that answer is the solid one because the solid one has the lower inertia, the hollow one has the higher inertia, the higher inertia means it resists the change in motion, which means it's going to accelerate more slowly. Therefore, the solid, solid one will accelerate more quickly and get down to the bottom first. I hope that makes sense. It's a very important concept in this. You can find different uh, uh, equations for different shapes and uh, different axes online and different resources. This is just an example of what that might look like, different uh, equations. All right, so what is the load to motor inertia ratio? Uh, if you have here a motor with a load on it, you have the ratio of the load over the motor. Uh, now note here, sometimes this is called the load to rotor inertia ratio because the rotor inside the motor is actually what has the inertia to it that spins. All right, so let's take an example of a motor's inertia compared to a load's inertia. inertia. Here's some typical values that ratio comes out to 11.8, okay? So that is the J ratio. J is the uh, terminology here for inertia, typically. All right, so that, that brings us to the question is, what is an ideal load to motor inertia ratio? Uh, I saw a long calculation done many years ago about calculating the energy usage that ends up in a graph like this. Uh, so this shows that the ideal ratio is one to one. All right. The problem with that is that if you have a one to one inertia ratio, if that's your target, you oftentimes end up with a motor that's just way too big in most systems. So you're not really going to usually hit one to one unless your load is really small, which is fine. All right. So let's ask about it for servos first. What's the load to a motor inertia ratio should I use for servos? All right. Servos have an algorithm inside their electronics that has to be tuned. Uh, it has a feedback system. There's a PID loop in there, proportional integral derivative loop that has math that has to be tuned for the application. So you're going to get a different answer for different manufacturers, different algorithms, and different applications. Um, all right, still begs the question, which one should you use? Some servos some manufacturers of servos will aim for 5 to 1. Uh, other ones will say 10, 15, 20 to 1. 20 is kind of what I've always used, but some drives and controls have algorithms that are so good you could really aim for 30 to 1, and that's fine. Part of this depends on how critical your application is. If you're trying to get the best performance out of your servo, you want to go for a lower inertia ratio. Uh, if you're just trying to make it work within reasonable uh, performance, you know, 10, 20, 30 to 1 is going to be just fine. Uh, what's the problem with going over that? The problem is it becomes very difficult to tune and maybe impossible to tune and maybe unstable. So if you find yourself unable to tune your servo system, check your inertia ratio and see if you're just way out of whack. All right, so what load to a motor inertia ratio should I use for steppers? Hmm, this is definitely much harder because steppers don't have a PID loop to tune. Uh, a lot of manufacturers will say 10 to 1. Other ones will say, I don't care. Why would I for a stepper? Because it's open loop most of the time. Well, the 
counter argument to the I don't care for the steppers is that steppers do have uh, mid range frequency resonance points that are inherent to the systems. They can be minimized by the electronics, but they're still going to be there to a certain degree. Also, no matter what, you're moving mechanics, and the mechanics are a mass spring system that's going to cause uh, some oscillations, and sometimes those create sharp points. And those sharp points, the motor has to overcome and change directions. So some would argue that the inertia has to do with over allowing the motor to overcome those those sharp points. All right, so 10 to 1, that's been my rule of thumb, and it's worked for me, for my career. So uh, what load to motor inertia ratio should I use for direct drives? Now, this is interesting because uh, you have motors typically are coupled to lead screws or belt pulleys or some mechanics, all right? So this flexible coupling right here causes some... Uh, some flexing. But what if the motor has a flange front or is a direct drive where you can bolt it to? If you can actually bolt your load to your motor or your rotary, uh, in some cases people will use much stiffer couplings than just like a flexible coupling here. But if you can bolt your load to your motor, then there's no compliance caused by that coupler. Now in this case, we really end up looking at 50 to 1, 100 to 1, even 200 to 1 inertia ratios that um, because that mo that motor and that load really are just one uh, one load as opposed to having a compliance that you have to tune out that that movement. So I hope this helps. There's a lot here. Uh, sometimes you just kind of have to kind of wag your thumb at it, wave a hand and say, I'm going to take my best guess. Uh, it depends on how much you're willing to risk, what the other factors are, and just kind of what performance you're wanting to get out of your system. Different manufacturers are going to give you, give you different guidelines, so definitely talk to them when picking a system. Or your distributors have even more experience across a number of manufacturers. I'm Corey Foster at Valen Corporation. I hope this helps.